Well, I, I think that the, um, the fundamental takeaway for me uh, in the testimony we heard today was that uh, this witness uh, acknowledged that the governor's statement in his December 13th press conference uh, where he asserted that he had inquired of his staff and that they all assured him that they had no knowledge, this witness said that that, that was essentially not an accurate statement. Uh, which is a significant development in this investigation because up until this point in time, uh, the line that uh, has been consistently repeated is that the governor uh, asked everybody, uh, everybody in his office uh, assured him that there was no information in his office about the lane closures when in fact uh, moments, literally moments before the governor went out and made that statement, uh, he was confronted with an email uh, that had been in the possession of Bridget Kelly uh, that said that Mayor Sokolich uh, was quite exercised about the lane closures and it was sent to her uh, from Christine Renner, her assistant, and it came to the governor's office from Mayor Sokolich. I think that's a significant development. In addition, uh, there are a number of times where uh, you have uh, testimony that doesn't match uh, with the Gibson Dunn report. You have varying timelines between what uh, Mr. O'Dowd recalled receiving information and, for instance, what's represented in the M uh, Gibson Dunn report that Mr. McKenna re recalled receiving information. And so, once again, we're in a position after a very long period of testimony of yet having even more questions uh, that we need to track down and get information and answers to. Senator Weinberg? Yeah, uh, you know, I keep on coming back to the line that I think sums this up the curious lack of curiosity. It, it is the theme that runs through this from the day Bridget Kelly got her email from Christine Renna. That by the way, that email says the mayor was very exorcised. First responders were having difficulty getting through. And it outlines some pretty, um, uh, pretty upsetting circumstances and then goes on to sort of explain that they took his call by accident because it had been patched through from another number to leave a distinct impression that Evan Ridley, who took the call, was not supposed to have answered a call from the mayor. So there are two or three issues raised in that email. Nobody asks a question about this from the day they learned about it the day it was read, it, it was sent to the governor's office in news clips. I think I outlined how many newspaper articles were the f in front of the governor's news clips on a daily basis. Nobody asked a question about anything. And uh, that to me is what set up the atmosphere to let, I think something else interesting came through here today, that Bill Baroni was slated to be let go before Bridgegate became an issue. So you have them allowing somebody who was slated to be let go for some, you know, I don't know, he was either burned out, he wasn't performing well, lack of performance. Then you have David, um, David Wildstein, who's described as the crazy person who came up with 50 crazy ideas a day and then you have the emotionally unstable Bridget Kelly. These are the three people they were trusting to get a straight story. Well, a curious a lack of curiosity. Go ahead. Chairman, you've had five witnesses now, and you still don't have the answer to the key question, who ordered these closures and why? You're right, we don't have it. And a lot of times when we're getting into the very basic uh, question as to who knew what when, a lot of time we have the consistent answer of a lack of recollection as to exactly what happened. But I think what's really troubling about the testimony we heard today along the lines of what Senator Weinberg just said is when Mr. O'Dowd was confronted with an email by Bridget Kelly, uh, he made no further inquiries beyond that email. 
when he was confronted with a second email later in that day. He made no further inquiries beyond that email. And so it seems like a, a lack of will to actually get to the bottom of why this issue had now percolated, at least from their perspective, into the governor's office. And that lack of curiosity is very troubling in somebody whose job it is is to be the chief of staff to the governor. Where do you go from here? Are you going to call any more witnesses before the budget's finalized? No, I, I, I don't know if you uh, heard our colloquy among our colleagues before we concluded the meeting. Uh, staff has a very serious responsibility to prepare the legislature for getting the budget done before the end of June. Uh, we're going to give staff an opportunity to focus their work on that. Uh, we also have a, a great deal of information now to consider uh, in terms of focusing our next subpoenas for uh, live testimony, and we're going to do that, and we're looking at uh, continuing the testimony right after the 4th of July holiday. A uh, quick question. On the, uh, on the Attorney General's app, Mr. Dowd's lack of, uh, lack of uh, curiosity as uh, Chief of Staff. He is now being nominated to be Attorney General of the State. What is his, uh, a lack of uh, uh, curiosity to, you know, this regard as a say about his ability to serve as a, uh, a serve as a attorney general? Well, as we stand and speak here today, there is no official nomination uh, of Mr. O'Dowd to serve as attorney general. There was a press statement uh, or some type of announcement mm -hmm. in 2013, but since then, there's been no official nomination, and so clearly, I know that uh, my, my co-chair serves on the, uh, the Senate Judiciary Committee, but it's premature to know whether that's actually, in fact, going to happen before uh, we uh, comment on that. But I will say that as, as a member of the Assembly, who often doesn't get an opportunity to opine on such matters, certainly the, the curious lack of curiosity is very troubling. What do you think, Senator? Well, I think uh, that Assemblyman Wisniewski outlined it. We don't have a nomination to deal with at the present moment. Uh, the governor never actually nominated Mr. O'Dowd. As he said, there was a press statement, and we're not going to conjecture about any of this until or unless we get a nomination. Were you guys surprised by Stepien's presence here today? Uh, well, Mr. Stepien obviously has been a subject of conversation not only in this hearing, but in many others. Uh, he was here today with his counsel. His counsel has been here at other hearings. And obviously, they have a very serious interest in what happens in this committee, and that's all I'll say on that. Do you take that as an indication that they might be willing to comply with a more narrowly focused uh, subpoena? I'm sure that if that's the case, uh, Mr. Marino uh, knows where to get a hold of Mr. Shar, or he could have approached either of his chairs. I'm not going to speculate as to what their motivation would be here, other than uh, they are linked, uh, whether they are happy about it or not with what happens in this room and i'm sure as part of his representation of his client uh, he wanted to be here to hear firsthand what mr o'dowd had to say and obviously there is uh, a controversy between exactly what mr stepien uh, says he said and what the master report and mr o'dowd says he said you're all aware uh, that mr marino sent the letter uh, questioning and contradicting uh, some of the assertions that have been made that Mr. Stepien uh, knew nothing about the lane closures. Uh, and I won't repeat the letter that Mr. Marino said, but clearly he is taking issue with some of the statements that have been made by people uh, in the governor's administration. What, what, do you, what do you think about O'Dowd's uh, comment today, that it's his sense at least that uh, the governor would not veto reform legislation regarding the port that would come out of your uh, committee? I think the governor's done just that. <laughs> I can attest to that. As the co-prime sponsor, he did veto reform legislation that we passed, conditionally vetoed and really gutted it. Uh, so this will be our second time around, and we'll see as the legislation gets developed. Michael? If you wanted to um, call in Charlie McKenna to testify, would there be any legal hurdles because he was chief counsel to the governor at that time that would make that complicated? I, I don't want to get into the specifics about but any, any particular witness and what hurdles we may or may not face, but he's certainly somebody that would be on our list and is a logical person, uh, not necessarily as a direct follow-up to this, but as a follow-up to the questioning we've been doing thus far. And so 
uh, I would ask you to stay tuned that you might see that at some point in the future. Could you talk a little bit about Regina Gia's email on October 16th talking about sticking to a script? What do you make of that? <laughs> well, that they stuck to the script. <laughs> Every time I went to the Port Authority, I was told the manner is, quote, under review. It was her words, uh, script, and uh, that was from the governor's office uh, talking about what the Port Authority should be doing. So um, since it concerned my appearance there, as I said, um, they stuck to the script during October, November, and December. Well, what I would just say to that is if the, if the directive was stick to the truth, uh, then that's what you'd say. Uh, I'm concerned that somebody would say stick to the script because that sounds scripted. How do you think Kevin O'Dowd's testimony in regards to Bridget Kelly uh, stood up to the portrayal in the Gibson Dunn report of Bridget Kelly? How, how, do, they, uh, how do they match up? Well, what's curious is that um, he uh, really had no um, doubt about what Bridget Kelly was telling him. You know, in contrast to an email that Pat Foy sent saying laws were broken, uh, that email was immediately, almost immediately discounted. Well, that's the New York, New Jersey back and forth, and why should we listen to him? Uh, Bridget Kelly says, I don't know anything about it, and it's gold, and it, he takes it at face value. I think that uh, uh, there are inconsistencies when you listen to Mr. O'Dowd's testimony and you look at Mr. McKenna's testimony, or when you listen to Mr. O'Dowd's testimony and you look at the governor's statement uh, in the Gibson Dunn report. And I think that uh, what we see is uh, varying degrees of inexactitude of when things happened and who knew what when. Um, and Mr. McKenna, in his Gibson Dunn statement, uh, does not recall having any conversation about the lane closures until November 25th or around the time Bill Baroni's testimony before the Assembly Transportation Committee. That's clearly a different picture than painted by Mr. O'Dowd. The Gibson Dunn uh, legal billings through February have now been released. It's up to $3 million through the end of February. Do you have any comment on how much that's costing at this point? It's a lot of money, and <laughs> it's not February. The report was issued, I think, in April. And so, you know, hold on to your hats because there's two more months of bills coming. Everybody good? Okay. Thanks Thank a lot. you. Thank you.